You're watching a message from Dr. Jim Dixon, founding senior pastor of Cherry Hills Community Church. Jim studied the scriptures, history, and current events to prepare purposeful and insightful sermons. Enjoy this sermon and be blessed. We are in the midst of a series called Chapter and Verse, and uh, today the verse we're focusing on is Micah, 6 8, one of my favorite verses, and we're going <clears> to <throat> take as our scripture verses 6 through 8. So we're beginning with Micah 6 6. <clears throat> with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Would the Lord be pleased? with thousands of rams or 10,000s of rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? The Lord has shown you, O oh man, what is good. For what does the Lord require of you but to seek justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? This ends the reading from God's holy word. Let's pray together before we have our message this morning. <clears throat> Dear Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> This coming Wednesday, some of us from the church are going to be traveling down to Memphis, Tennessee for the General Assembly of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. The Evangelical Presbyterian Church was established in St. Louis in 1980, had its first General Assembly in Detroit in 1981, and I was one of the founders of the denomination. I was there in St. Louis in 1980. I was there in Detroit in 1981. And, and of course, I was younger, and I can tell you that my role was very small. But now I, I'm the only founder who remains active in ministry, and wherever I go to denominational things, I'm venerated in ways I don't want to be uh, as the oldest guy around. Um, we are looking forward to a great General Assembly down in Memphis. I remember one of the earliest General Assemblies, uh, we invited Francis Schaefer to come and speak to us. Francis Schaefer is, was the founder of Labrie, a Christian uh, conference center in Switzerland. He was also uh, perhaps uh, one of the most influential, influential Christians in the second half of the 20th century, a great thinker and a a great theologian, the author of over 20 books. 1975, he published uh, his renowned book called How Should We Then Live? Uh, the Rise and Fall of Western Thought and Culture. In light of the rise and fall of Western thought and culture, how should we then live? I think it's a question that all Christians should ask, how should we then live? And particularly, once you become a Christian, you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. He, he's, you've accepted him as your Savior from sin, and you've embraced him as Lord of Lords. And how should you then live? A Christian, by grace through faith, living in a fallen world, how should you live? Many verses in the Bible have suggested as answers. Some have suggested the golden rule, from the Sermon on the Mount, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That's how you should live. And that's not a bad answer. Others have suggested the Shema and its corollary, Deuteronomy 6, Leviticus chapter 19, 18. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's not a bad answer either. But, but another answer that could be given is our verse today, Micah 6, 8. How should we then live? The Lord has shown you, O oh man, what is good. 
For what does the Lord require of you but to seek justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God? So understand, this is not a salvific verse. It's not the means of salvation. We're saved by faith in Christ through grace. But this has to do with how we should live out our lives. So we're going to look at these three ingredients. First of all, seek justice. Seek justice. Some of you, if you've studied British and American history, have heard of William Kidd. William Kidd was born in 1645 in Scotland. And as a young man, he became a privateer. Privateers were people who captained their own ship, but they were given permission by the British government to bear arms, to have a warship, and to use their ship to defend the cause of Britain. So for many years, William Kidd was a privateer. In 1691, when he was 46 years old, he moved to New York, to the British colonies. And in New York, he married, and he was kind of a renowned sea captain in New York and uh, part of the establishment, and he helped to establish and found the Trinity Church in New York City. 1695, William Kidd crossed the ocean and returned to London where he was commissioned by King William III, commissioned to captain a British warship and to fight piracy in the seas and also to fight the French, who were the enemies of the British. This William Kidd did. He fought uh, in the Mediterranean and in the Atlantic Oceans. He, he seized the bounty of many pirate ships, and that bounty was rightfully his. And, of course, he sunk many French ships in the Mediterranean, in the Atlantic, uh, off the coast of India, in the Red Sea. And along the coast of Africa, uh, at Madagascar, uh, he had a kind of a fallout with his uh, chief gunner, a man named William Moore, and half of the crew sided with William Moore, half of the crew sided with William Kidd, and so William Kidd was left with just half of a crew. He sailed to the West Indies, and in the West Indies he received the stunning news that he was now declared a pirate by the British Crown. They accused him of, of attacking not only pirate ships, and the French ships that were enemies of England, but they accused him of attacking ships that were friendly to England and seizing their bounty. William Kidd said, it's not true. <clears throat> I didn't do it. He fled to New York City, where he and some friends buried some of the treasure that they felt was rightfully theirs. And then he went to Boston, where he was arrested. From Boston, he was taken back to London. He was put on trial. He was not allowed to defend himself. The record show, and we have the record, the record shows that he just said one phrase over and over again, I am a just man. I'm a just man. I'm a just man. I'm a just man. And they uh, convicted him. They hanged him. His body was left to rot by the Thames in the city of London. And of course, in the aftermath of his death, his life, was embellished and his exploits embellished. And of course, legends developed that William Kidd had treasure buried all over the earth. And of course, ultimately, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote his famed book, Treasure Island, basing it on William Kidd. Today, today, um, historians are divided as they examine the life of William Kidd. Was he guilty? Was he innocent? Was it somewhere in between? You could find historians everywhere on the subject. But, of course, the reality is he thought himself a just man. And by what he meant by that was that he had kept the laws of England, that he had not violated the civil laws of the British crown. Now, someday, each and every one of us are going to appear before judgment before the judgment seat of Christ, before the final judgment, each and every one of us. And what are you going to say? Are you going to say, I'm a just woman? I'm a just man? What are you going to say? And of course, the Bible makes it clear that with regard to the laws of God, 
None of us are just. With regard to the laws of God, none of us are righteous. And the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thrust of the Sermon on the Mount is that God looks on the inside. He looks at our thoughts, our motives, and and in the inner person, there is none righteous, no, not one. And so uh, we know when we appear at the judgment seat that Christ uh, is our hope. And uh, his righteousness imputed to us is what the gospel promises. We have no righteousness of our own. But the, um, the heart of the Christian should still long for righteousness. The heart of the Christian should long for holiness. And the question this morning is, do you long for holiness? Is there any part of you, as you sit here this morning, any part of you that just longs to be holy? Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do you ever hunger for righteousness? Do you ever thirst for holiness? Do you seek justice in that sense? Certainly that's part of the meaning here. But but it's not the whole of the meaning because the Hebrew word for justice is the word mispot. And that's transliterated into English as M-I-S-P-A-T, mispot. And this is a little bit different than the Greek word for justice, which is dikaios. The, The Greek word for justice normally refers to the holiness and righteousness we've referred to. But this Hebrew word, occasionally refers to holiness and righteousness. Normally, it refers to fairness. It refers to a just world. It refers to a just society, what you might call social justice, how you treat the poor, how you treat the oppressed. This is all part of mispot. So so what God is saying here is, is, how then shall we live you must seek a just society. Seek justice means to seek a fair world. Now, this is a little bit different. It's different than personal holiness. So, so do you ever wake up in the morning and, and do you ever think about how can I make my neighborhood, my place of work, my city, my country, a, a fairer place, a place that treats people more justly? This is the concept that is, that is before us. And of course, uh, throughout history, many have longed for a fair world. I think it's in the heart of people to just kind of desire a more just world. And of course, Plato, the Greek philosopher, dreamed of Atlantis and thought of Atlantis and wrote about Atlantis. And he had access to ancient Egyptian manuscripts which most historians believe he misread. He misread the dimensions and the geography, and he was off by a factor of 10, so he mislocated the people of Atlantis, and many historians believe that the Minoan civilization was what he was referring to. The Minoan civilization was was destroyed by volcanic eruption when Santorini or Thera exploded, But, but it was in the heart of Plato to kind of long for this better world, this more just world, this world where there was beauty and equality. And of course, uh, Coleridge dreamed of Xanadu. And of course, Coleridge dreamed of Xanadu in a drug-induced stupor, but, uh, but he had this in his heart. And when Coleridge was asked, what is your favorite, what are the favorite words In the whole world of literature, what are your favorite words ever written? He said the Sermon on the Mount, and specifically Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 16, which includes the Beatitudes and the call of Christ to be salt and light in the world. So even in Coleridge, this messed up man, this brilliant but messed up man, there was this longing in Coleridge, this longing for, for a better world, a just world, a fair world. And uh, he wanted to see society purified by salt and light. And of course, Hilton dreamed of Shangri-La. And we can look back at American history. See, many of our um, political leaders 
who dreamed of a, of a better world and a better society, a better nation. You can look at the great seal of the United States, and on the back side of the great seal, you see Novus Ordo Seclorum, and those are Latin words, Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means new order of the ages, and it was the dream. It was the dream of our founders that, that we would create this new order, and it would have justice, and it would be fair, and uh, it would be uh, a just society. And of course, Franklin Roosevelt uh, offered the New Deal, and Harry Truman, the fair deal, where he, equaled, he, he mentioned equal rights and equal opportunity. Uh, John Kennedy dreamed of the new frontier. George Herbert Walker Bush uh, spoke of a new world order, although uh, many believe that Woodrow Wilson was the first to mention that phrase, but we've had many leaders who have dreamed of a just world. And the question is, do you... And if you do, what are you doing about it? Are you doing anything? And what would you do? If you wanted the world to be a little fair, if you really care, cared about the poor, if you really cared about the impoverished, if you really were concerned about oppression in our country and around the world, what would you do? And I'm just saying, we give you opportunity right here at Cherry Hills Community Church. That's why we have 21 ministries in the inner city, because we want a fair world. We want a just world. That's why we offer to train you and to send you into the inner city to mentor kids, teenagers and elementary school kids, Hispanic kids, African-American kids, poor kids, that someday they might, you know, compete for the dignity of a job, that we might help them in their education, that we might show them the love of Jesus. It's an opportunity, you see, to seek justice. And that's why we have man of ministries here at the church. That's why we do it every week, week after week without end. And there's no limit to the poor, to the people who need food, the people who need medical care, the people who need clothing. But have you ever thought, hey, Maybe I'll be part of that. And how shall we then live? Seek justice. I mean, we long for the new heavens and the new earth. We long for the new Jerusalem. It's all down the road. But today, what are we doing? Well, love kindness that's the second charge given to us, that we would love kindness. And this is an awesome word in the Hebrew, the word for kindness. Uh, it's the word hesed, transliterated as H-E-S-E-D, but sometimes transliterated because of uh, the phonetics in Hebrew as kesed. So it could be transliterated as C-H-E-S-E-D, and it is, without doubt, the most beautiful word in the Hebrew language, not phonetically, not by its sound, but by its meaning. Because hesed is the word in the early church, in the first century, when Jewish men and women accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah, when Jewish men and women accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, what word for them, what Hebrew word summed up the gospel? It was this word, hesed, summed up the gospel. And it is as close as, as the Hebrew can possibly get to the New Testament concept of grace. And in fact, when you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, you find four Greek words, four different Greek words used to render this one Hebrew word, hesed. And the four Greek words, the four New Testament words are agape, which refers to love and divine love, and charis, which is the New Testament word for grace, and elios, which is the New Testament word for mercy, and krestos, which is the New Testament word for kindness. These four words are used to render the one Hebrew word. So deep, so beautiful is this word kesed. And so... 
This is what God expects of us. How shall we then live? He wants us to be people of compassion. There is no word in the Hebrew language more rooted and rich in the concept of compassion than this word kesed. So you now when you come to the New Testament, let's do a brief review. You come to the New Testament and, and you see that there are levels of compassion and Christ calls us to the deepest level. So in the New Testament, we see levels of compassion and we're called to the, to the depths, the deepest level of compassion. The, at, the, at, the, you know, at the lowest level, at the most shallow level is the Greek word sympathos. And we get what English word from the word sympathos? Some of you actually spoke. That's pretty good. We get the word sympathy from the Greek word sympathos. And it literally means to suffer with, sum with, and pathos, to suffer, to suffer with, to feel what someone else feels. And we all have this kind of compassion. There's no one in this room that has a complete inability to feel what someone else feels. We, we all have some level of sum pathos, some level of compassion. And, and you know, that's why when you go to a movie and, and, and you see a, you know, somebody lose a loved one or, or you see somebody in the pain of divorce or some kind of deep hurt, you tear up. You tear up because you are in the image of God and you have this ability to emote, to, to show compassion, sum pathos, we all have that. And when a friend of you, a friend of yours comes up to you and says, you know, my wife just left me or my husband just left me and they start to cry, you cry because you feel what they feel. It's sum pathos. Now there's a deeper word though. A second word that, that we're called to and it's deeper forms of compassion. It's eusplonchnos. And eusplonchnos is literally the prefix you, E-U, which means good, and then splonchnos, which is translated heart, but doesn't mean heart. Uh, the actual Greek word for heart would be cardia, so we, we, we have a different word here, and splonchnos is a word that means bowels. You can understand maybe why it's not translated good bowels. That, that sounds like, you know, some high-fiber diet deal or something. But, but understand that in our culture, in our culture, we think of the emotions as centered in the heart, right? We think of the emotions as centered in the heart. We think of compassion as centered into the heart. And we think of love as kind of a heart deal. But in ancient cultures, they, they thought a little bit lower, a little further down. That they thought of the emotions and compassion as kind of centered in the stomach or in the intestines or in the bowels. And so tender-hearted is the meaning. It's not the literal meaning, but it would be the meaning in our culture. And this is used, this word knows is used, of not simply feeling what somebody else feels, but doing something about it. That's what makes this form of compassion deeper. So if you have knows, you not only feel what somebody else feels, you're not only capable of tears, you do something about it. It's love in action. You splonchnos, love in action. You're moved to action, the meaning of the word. And so if you care about people, uh, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? And I want you to see a little clip uh, from the movie Blindside. Up and at him. Sean Jr., you clean this room up before you come downstairs, you hear me? <laughs> okay, big smile. Do eat that, me. Let me get it, doll. Everyone, thank your mother for driving to the store and getting this. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Mom. He's been enrolled in seven different institutions, including a gap of 18 months around the age of 10, when he apparently didn't attend school at all. I tell you, most kids with his background wouldn't come within 200 miles of this place. Class, this is Mike Orr, and he's new here, so I expect you all to make him feel welcome. Hi. 
Smile at them. It lets them know you're their friend. I'm Sean. Who is that, Esther? Big Mike. What is he wearing? It's below freezing. You have any place to stay tonight? Don't you dare lie to me. Is this a bad idea? What's the big deal? It's just for one night. It is just for one night, right? Find some time to figure out another bedroom for you. This is mine? Yes, sir. I haven't had one before. What, a room to yourself? A bed. All right, that's what you're doing, but don't be surprised if one day you wake up and he gone. My cold's here. Last night. Tell him to sleep with one eye open. You threaten my son. You threaten me. Michael's grades have improved enough that he can go out for spring football in March. Dean is your family, Michael. When you look at him, you think of me. How you have my back. Are you going to protect the family, Michael? Yes, ma'am. SJ, you're going to want to get this. Who's the big guy eating with your little brother? His big brother. I think what you're doing is so great. Sandra Boy. Hey, you're changing that boy's life. No. He's changing mine. Blind side. Now, that was actually the trailer uh, for Blindside. And, and of course, the story is about Michael Moore, excuse me, Michael Orr, who is the great NFL football player. We had him right here at our church. We had Michael Orr here in conjunction with a, a Valor Christian High School event. And, of course, the movie is about a Christian family, a Christian family that adopts Michael Orr and uh, exhibits loving kindness. And it's also about a Christian high school and the ministry that that high school has in Michael Orr's life. And uh, it's about love and action. And basically, it is true that when you practice loving kindness, oftentimes you also serve social justice or you also seek justice. And so we have this truth that if we're going to make the world better, if we're going to make the world fairer, if this is going to be a more just world, then we're all going to have to roll up our shirt sleeves and do some acts of loving kindness. And so most of the stuff that we invite you to do, even the stuff in the inner city or with world vision that might be in other parts of the world, serve to make the world a more just world, a more fair world, but they also involve the need for loving kindness. And so these kind of go hand in hand, and we're asking you to, to be part of this. But you splanchnos, it, it doesn't simply mean to feel what someone else feels, but to do something about it. So this Christian family decided to do something about it, and they did. There's a deeper word in the New Testament for compassion, and that's, of course, the word elios. And elios is the deepest form of compassion. It's oftentimes translated in your New Testament simply as compassion, but sometimes it's translated as mercy. But it means to show loving kindness to someone who doesn't deserve it. Now, this is a deeper concept. So Jesus taught us this word elios, he called us to this word, Elias, and it means to show loving kindness to people who don't deserve it. And even to show loving kindness to our enemies, to show loving kindness to people who don't like us, to show loving kindness maybe to people we don't like. This is the deepest form. And so Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And in the story of the Good Samaritan, you know that Samaritans and Jews hated each other had no dealings with each other, had different religions, different races, great hatred. And so Jesus tells this story about what it means to love your neighbor. And he's calling for loving kindness, even to your enemy. In the midst of the story, as Jesus talks about the Samaritan going down the Jericho road and finding the wounded Jew, Jesus uses the word usplonchnos. It says the Samaritan. Upon seeing the wounded man was 
moved with compassion, usplanchnos, and being moved with compassion, went to him, ministered to him, put on ointment, bandages, uh, uh, bandages, put him on his beast, took him to an inn, cared for him, love in action, usplanchnos. And then at the end of the parable, Jesus says to the lawyer, who's the one that showed love? Who's the one that proved a neighbor? And the lawyer uses the word Elios because he understood this was loving your enemy. This is the deepest kind of loving kindness. Jesus was calling upon him to love his enemy. And that's what he's calling upon us to do. And so how then shall we live? We seek justice. We love kindness, even in the deepest sense. And then finally, we walk humbly. We walk humbly with, uh, with God. We walk humbly with our God. And the word for humble in this is sana, S-A-N-A. Uh, and it's the only place in the Old Testament the word is found in this particular form. Uh, but its meaning is very similar to a common Hebrew word for humility, ana, which is found 70 times. Both sana and ana mean submission. They mean submission. And so the concept here is obedience. How then shall we live? We seek justice. We love kindness and we learn obedience. Walking humbly with God. Learning obedience, submission. And of course, understand again, this verse, Micah 6, 8, is not about salvation. We're not saved by our obedience. We're saved by faith in Christ, by his grace, by the cross, but we're called to obedience. We're not saved by obedience, but we're called to obedience. And so how shall we then live? We need to learn obedience. And... Uh, you know, the word ana literally means to bow down. Understand, Jesus is looking for his people to bow down. He doesn't want us to just tip the hat. All kinds of people tip the hat. You know, you can watch award ceremonies from Hollywood. A lot of people tip the hat to God. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're caught watching country music awards, hip-hop awards, rap awards, rock awards. They all get up there. Many of them get up there. First, I want to thank God. Tip the hat. Not enough. He wants us to bow down. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do? Not all who call me Lord in that day. Uh, will receive eternal life. It says, to many I'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Not you know, it's those who do the will of my Father uh, who are blessed. And so, I, I, you know, we're called to walk humbly and to learn submission and uh, to learn obedience. Um, now, on 9-11, on September the 11th of this year, our nation will remember. This will be the 10th anniversary. This September 11th, the 10th anniversary of September 11th, 2001, and the uh, tragic terrorist act perpetrated on New York City in the Twin Towers. And so our whole nation will remember. Now here at the church, this September 11th, it's a Sunday, and that evening, Sunday evening, we're gonna have a special event on that 9-11. And we are going to invite all of you. And it's gonna be a special event that deals with Islam. It'll be headed up by the Institute at Cherry Hills, by Lee Strobel and Mark Middleberg. It's going to be a special night. And it's going to have to do with understanding Islam. And it's amazing how many people, after all this time, have such little understanding of Islam. And it's also going to seek to help us understand how to bring Jesus to the Islamic world and to those Muslims uh, hopefully we'll get to know. Um, so it's going to be a very important night. Now, I don't know how you feel about Islam. My guess is many of you don't like it. I understand that. And in fact, very personally, I mean, I, I believe that the Koran and the Hadith and the Islamic faith uh, has and is 
deceiving hundreds of millions of people. Wonderful people, precious people are being deceived by the Quran and by the Hadith and by the Islamic faith. And this is indeed tragedy. There are 1 billion, 300 million Muslims in this world, nominally. 1 billion, 300 million. Uh, some of them are Arabs. Most Muslims are not Arabs, but most Arabs are Muslims. So 90% of Arabs are Muslim. About 300 million, that means a, a billion Muslims are not Arab, but about 300 million uh, Arabs are Muslim. And uh, I don't know how you feel about Arab people. I don't know how many Arab people you know or have ever met, but the Arab people are a wonderful people. Uh, they have great passion. They have great hospitality. They have uh, um, uh, great love. And, and the truth of the matter is, when Barb and I traveled some years ago to Jordan, or the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, east of the Jordan River, and to the city of Amman, a lot of tourists go to Amman on their way to Petra or Jerash. But we had a couple of days just to hang out. And if you walk around Amman, you see Arab hospitality. And it's really amazing, as people came out of their houses, they didn't know us at all. We're just walking neighborhoods, and Arabs would come out of their houses and say, oh, please come in and have a cup of tea with us. Come in and have a cookie and tea with us, and we did. Then truth of the matter is, there was such a, a sense of, of um, friendliness. And it was really genuine. It was really wonderful. And when we told them we were from America, they said, we love Americans. That's not true in every Arab nation. Uh, but it is somewhat true in Jordan. And, and uh, we received very warm uh, welcome there. And, of course, the Arab people are very proud of their history, proud of their culture, proud of Arab architecture and the arts. Uh, they're glass blowers, they're metal metal makers, they're they're pottery makers, particularly in the zenith of their culture from 700 to 1700. Incredible works of architecture and art, and of course they're very proud of their literature, Arab literature, from the 200 tales of the Arabian Nights with Ali Baba and Sinbad to the 114 surahs of the Quran. They're very proud of their literature. They're very proud of, of uh, their culture. They're very proud even of their, of their horses. And of course, Arabian horses were bred in Arabia and, and uh, they are saddle horses, a little bit smaller than quarter horses, but ma majestic and beautiful. And, and I've told you the legend that came out of, uh, you know, Arab myth, the legend of how the Arabian horses were bred, and, and it's not a true story. It's a legend, but it's a cool story about how Muhammad, and of course Muhammad was Arab, and how he searched the world over for a hundred of the finest horses. He brought them back to Arabia, and there he trained them to respond to his bugle, to submit and to obey. And so he would blow his bugle and the horses had to stop whatever they were doing and come to him. And then he decided to test them. And so Muhammad took the hundred horses and put them on top of a hill in an enclosure uh, above a freshwater stream. And he denied them water. He denied them water. And when their thirst was great, uh, he opened the corral and these hundred horses just raced down the bank towards the river. And when they were almost to the water, he took out his bugle and he blew it. And 97 of the horses continued on into the water and drank. And three dug their hoofs into the earth and stopped. And of course, as the legend goes, from those three he bred the great race of Arabian horses. It's not true, but it's a cool story. <laughs> not true. The truth is, is that Muhammad had nothing to do with the breeding of Arabian horses. But uh, it is true that in the Arab culture, submission is of 
supreme value. In the Arab culture, submission is the key to everything. And in the Islamic world, in the Muslim world, submission is the key to everything. In Islam, Islam means submission. And in Islam, you find salvation by submission to God. Liberal Muslims, liberal Muslims would view Christians and Jews as saved by their submission. If we are submissive to God, they would say it's all part of submission. Submission is the key to everything. Submission to God. And it's the key to salvation and blessing, um, the key to all the blessings of life. And of course, as Christians, we know that's not right. We know that the key to everything is grace. It's the grace of God. It's the cross of Christ. It's faith in Christ and salvation by his grace alone. Uh, but once we're saved, we are called to submission. This call is clearly given in Scripture that we've been called to submit to him. And, and how are you doing with that? I mean, do you wake up each day and you think, well, you know, how can I seek justice today? How can I seek to make a fairer world? And how can I love kindness? What compassion can I do today? And oh, how am I doing in terms of walking humbly with my God? How am I submitting to the authority of Christ? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You can't live life in this world without, you know, uh, learning to say no. There's certain things you can't do, places you can't go, because you're followers of Jesus. You've got to be different than the world. Live differently. How shall we then live differently? So what does the Lord require of you but to seek justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly? Let's look to the Lord with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your kindness, for your chesed, your loving kindness, your merciful grace. Thank you for the cross and thank you for being our Savior. We praise you because you conquered death and offer eternal life in your Lord. Uh, Lord, you have saved us by that grace, and we pray now that we would live as you have called us to live. You have told us that you want us uh, to seek justice. You quoted Micah 6, 8 in Matthew 23, 23. You called justice, uh, kindness, and humble faith uh, the weightier matters of the law. So, Lord, help us to focus on the weightier matters of the law in your sight. Help us, Lord, to seek justice and um, to seek to make this world a fair place. Help us to care about the poor and the oppressed and the hurting. And, Lord, uh, help us to love kindness. Help us to show compassion. Lord, help us to have love in action, not just feeling what others feel, but doing something about it and help us to extend that compassion even to those we don't like. And Lord, help us to learn humility before you, submission, that we would not simply be hearers of the word, but doers as well. We pray these things, Jesus, in your great and matchless name. Amen.